Romans, and we're going all the way to the last letter of the New Testament, the Revelation of Christ, and we are doing an overview of each of these letters. Each week we're taking the next letter in the New Testament, we're telling you who the author was, who the audience was, and what the intended action of the letter was uh, to the audience to whom it was written. And by doing this, what we're doing is, later on, when you're sitting at home and you're reading your Bible at home, you will have the information necessary to be able to understand each book, why it was written, who it was written to, what the important message of that book is, and now you can then uh, believe the promises of God that are in it, and you can apply its truths to your life. So this is what, uh, if you were in Bible college, this is what you would kind of call a New Testament survey. We're going through the letters of the New Testament and giving you the general understanding of each letter. And this morning we're in Galatians. We're looking at one of the Pew Bibles. You can find the text on page 147 in your New Testament. That's the second part of the Bible. If you're kind of new to the Bible, the large numbers are the chapter numbers. Small numbers are the verse numbers. And this one's easy because we're in Galatians chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 1 to verse number 5 by way of introduction. 
begins by saying, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all of the brethren who are with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. The book of Galatians is fascinating. And as I have been preparing for this survey of Galatians, I couldn't help but be reminded, especially this past week, I just, uh, I think the Lord just kept reminding me of a television show I saw years and years ago. The name of the television show was Life. Life is what they took, and life is what they gave him. Life was about a Los Angeles police officer named Charlie Cruz. And the show begins the very first episode by giving you the backstory. And at the introduction of the first episode, what you learn is Charlie was this L.A. police officer, and he was framed, wrongfully accused of murdering his best friend and his best friend's wife family. So they give him life. Now here he goes off to Pelican Bay. Not a pleasant place for a police officer to go. Years later, through DNA evidence and the, the work of the lawyer, they are able to prove that Charlie was innocent. He did not commit this murder. He had been wrongfully in prison and there were shenanigans going on in the police department and so forth. So he is released He's totally set free, declared innocent, and he also gets a settlement from the state. And it's like 50 plus million. But as a part of the settlement, Charlie also gets a job back with the LA Police Department where he becomes a homicide detective. And the partner that they give him is a young lady named Charlie, or her name is Reese, Danny Reese. So you got Charlie Cruz, who just come out of the penitentiary and is a new homicide detective, along with Danny Reese, who is a former alcoholic, still struggling sometimes with it. She is mean and rough and tough and coarse, and he is like in the zen and quirky and goofy. So they kind of play off each other. It was a fun little TV show. But the reason I kept thinking about that TV show this past week it's because there's an episode, and every one of the episodes, like every other crime show, begins, there's a murder. And then our two detectives have to figure out who committed the murder. And at the beginning of this particular episode, there was a young lady who was found dead. She'd been murdered. She was a young homeless girl. Played the guitar. Hung around places and played the guitar for food and, and money and that kind of stuff. And so they go, they find out that she used to hang around this store. So they go to this store. When they get to this store, they notice that a carving on her guitar is identical to this kid who's riding his skateboard. He's got the same carving. So they start talking to this kid, teenage kid, good kid. And in the middle of their conversation, his dad, who is running the store, comes out. He intervenes in the conversation and he pretty quickly makes it known he doesn't want his kid talking to the cops, and he don't want the cops talking to his kid, and that kind of ends that little moment. A little bit later in the show, they figure out they need to talk to this kid. And now they know where the dad lives, so they go to the apartment looking for the kid. Now the kid comes in, and he's gonna, he's the, the cops are, you know, Danny and Charlie, they're standing there at the door. You're not supposed to go in without a warrant, but Charlie Cruz looks into this apartment and he sees something that really disturbs him. And he just walks on in. He's really quirky in the show. He just kind of walks on in. And, and Reese is like, Charlie, don't have a warrant. You can't do that. He, just, uh, he never listens to anybody. He just kind of goes. And he says, Daddy, there are bars on the windows and locks on the windows. She said, Charlie, I know you've been locked up for several years, but we are in Los Angeles. And every house and every apartment around here has locks on the doors and they have bars on the windows. He 
So it reads, the bars and the locks are not on the outside. The bars are on the inside of the windows. He points to this kid's bedroom and there's all these padlocks down to the door of the kid's bedroom. He said, this is not a place to live. This is a prison. Now, through the course of this show, come to find out somebody else did the murder. The kid had nothing to do with it. But kind of the subplot of this particular episode was, through the course of this show, what they discover is the dad is not the dad. This kid, this teenage kid that they've been interviewing, when he was just a little bitty fellow playing in the yard, he was snatched by a kidnapper. That's who the dad is. And for years, he had kept him locked up and confined in this, in this prison-type environment. And this kid, he, he never knew any different. He thought that was his dad. So they're able to, you know, uh, Reese and Cruz, they locate the kid's real family. And this mom and dad who loved their son, they had been heartbroken, living in misery, battling. They've been destroyed for years and years, wondering where in the world is our son? God, please send our son home. And, and so they find the family, and, and they bring the family to the police department. And they are just overwhelmed with emotion. They're going to get their son back. But the son actually helps the dad try to get away. The dad figure, the kidnapper. And the reason is, growing up that way, imprisoned that way, bars on his window, locked in his bedroom, not allowed to talk to anybody, interact with anybody, have anything to do with anybody. After all those years, when they were telling him, this is not your real dad, you were kidnapped, all this stuff, this kid breaks down. He's a mess. That's my dad. He loves me. That's how life's supposed to be. I don't want to go anywhere near these other people. He wanted to be in prison. And he had fallen in love with his captor. And he didn't know any different. This is my daddy. This is the life I want. He wanted nothing to do with these people who were his real parents, who really loved him, who wanted to give him freedom and license and a car and let him date girls and let him have friends and let him play sports and let him meet other people and let him have a life and go to church. And they wanted to give him freedom and liberty and bless him and everything that he needed. And he's like, no, 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 no. This is what real family is, being a captain. Isn't that sad? Isn't that heartbreak? That's the story of Galatians. Galatians is a story of a group of people who grew up enslaved, in bondage, bearing the heavy weight of the legalistic rules and rituals of the old covenant law that we call Torah. And now Jesus Christ has come. The perfect sacrifice that purifies us and, and sets us before God as holy and without blame. Along comes Jesus Christ to set us free from the law, free from the bondage, free from the prison of the captivity of tradition and legalism and do's and don'ts and laws and all that stuff. He came to set the captives free. But many of these people have grown up so entrenched in that old covenant Torah legalism they couldn't accept a God who loved them and set them free and freely forgave them without them doing anything to hurt them. Now, as we've done each week, we've looked at the author, the audience, and the intended action. And the author, as we see back in verse number one, is Paul the Apostle, who grew up under that same legalistic, traditional bondage, Second Temple Judaism, a, a, a leader among that group. And he says... He identifies himself as an apostle, as one who was called and sent to them by the resurrected King Jesus. In other words, he says it wasn't men from Jewish synagogues who, who, were, who managed the law and enforced the laws and all that stuff that, that come with letters of commendation. He said, God sent me. 
So what he's doing is he is establishing his apostolic authority. He's saying, what I tell you in this letter, it trumps what these legalistic people are telling you about laws, rules, regulations, holy days, food law. What I'm telling you trumps because I got my gospel directly from God himself, a risen King Jesus. And then the audience. And every word Paul selects here is carefully chosen. He calls them the faithful brethren in Galatia. The reason he's using faithful is because that's going to become the heart and soul of this book. Faith, faithfulness, trust, loyalty. This is the means of salvation. By having the work of Jesus applied to our life, it's by faith in Jesus, not by keeping a whole set of laws. So he calls them the faithful, and of course he says the church, as you see, it's plural, in Galatia, because there were four churches. There was one in the city of Antioch, then Iconium, then Lystra, and then Derbe. And you can read in Acts 13 and 14 when these churches were founded by Paul. But, but to kind of give you an idea again of what's going on, Christianity begins in the first century predominantly as a Messianic Jewish movement. The majority of the first Christians were all Jews who came to faith in Christ. Now these people again had grown up under Old Covenant, Torah, Law, Judaism. And, and they believed that in order to be a part of the family of God, you had to be circumcised as a male. In order to be a part of the family of God, you, you had to observe holy days and feasts and things of that nature. In order to be a part of the family of God, you had to observe all of the rules of Torah, including the kosher laws. Can I just pause and say this? We live under a better covenant because kosher laws says I can't have bacon, tenderloin, sausage, or ribs. You people never had tenderloin. They never had ribs. And no wonder they were cranky and making everybody else miserable. They never had bacon. And so some of these people come in after Paul is gone. They come into these churches in Galatia. And, and listen, I want you to keep this in mind. We talk about all the people in the first century and they love their Bibles and read their Bibles. Come on, folks. 90 plus percent illiterate. So you got these folks coming in and they can quote Bible verses left and right and they know the law, they know the Word of God, and they start telling these other people who have got, because Christianity spread quickly. It stopped being a Jewish Messianic movement. It's spreading to the whole world and pretty soon you've got as many non-Jewish Christians as you do Jewish Christians. And you've got these people that we call them legalizers, Judaizers, still holding on to the old covenant. They said Jesus wasn't enough. So they come into these churches and they look at the gym, they look at you and me, and they say, now listen, you're not yet really in God's family. You're not really, yet really a child of God. If you want to be, they looked at all the men and they got out some sharp rocks and they said, we need to begin circumcising you. That went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> Read about that in Acts 15. That calls the first ecumenical council of all the churches to come together because these Gentile men stood up and said, no, we ain't about that kind of life. No, 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 no. So they had to settle that first and foremost. And then they said, well, you can't be eating bacon and tenderloin and ribs. And they said, no, we ain't about that life either. We're having bacon for breakfast. Well, they said, well, you also, you have to keep all these holy days. You can't wear certain stuff. You can't have mixed thread. You can't dress a certain way. You can't. There's all this stuff you can and can't do, and that's what makes you a part of God's family. So the action, the intention of this book is when Paul finds out this is going on, that these people have come into the churches, and they're making all these rules and regulations in order for a person to be a Christian. He is madder than a wet he writes this scathing, and I say scathing because he says some things in here about he wishes that some of these people, he said some of these people coming in there telling you all this stuff, I wish their manhood was removed so they could never reproduce and there'd be nobody else like them in the world. That's strong language. But that's how important the gospel is. That's how important getting the message of salvation right really is. So Paul writes this letter and he wants them to know there's one gospel. And he calls it, importantly, the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. And what that means is this. The good news 
is that God saves us by a gift freely given and freely received. And that gift is Jesus Christ who is our Savior, our Lord, our King, our resurrection, our redemption, our righteousness. Jesus is the gift of God for salvation. And there is no other good news. It's not Jesus plus anything else. It's Jesus only. So, he, the letter is broken into three different sections. In chapters 1 and 2, he presents the gospel. In chapters 3 and 4, he concludes from that that God wants one family. There's one family of Abraham. There's one church. And it's, it's multi-ethnic. It's people from every kindred, nation, and tongue. And ain't you happy about that? Jesus didn't come for one little tiny ethnic group. He came for people from every walk of life. And then in the end, in chapters 5 and 6, he, he reminds us that if you want to see somebody's life change, the law can't do it. It keeps them in prison. But the gospel sets us free to be the people God made us to be. So very quickly, the three parts, chapters 1 and 2, he presents the gospel. Now I want you to look at verse 6 through 9 of chapter 1 very quickly. Paul says, I am amazed. That means astonished. That means flabbergasted. That means mouth wide open, hands on the cheek. Can't believe this. I can't believe that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace, by the gift of Christ for a different gospel, a different message. Which is not really another. In other words, this other message you're getting, it's not good news. And he says, but there are some who are disturbing you and they want to distort the good news of Christ. But if we, listen to this, if we, mean the apostles, the dignitaries, uh, the, the leaders in the church, he said, or an angel from heaven, because many of the Jewish believers <laughs> rightly believe that much of the Old Testament was transmitted to men from angels, sent, messengers sent from God. <laughs> Uh, Jacob, the, the angels going up and down, well, that's common understanding. He said, if an angel comes down from heaven and tells you there's a different type or a different way to be saved, notice what he says. If anyone, even an angel from heaven, preaches to you a contrary gospel other than what we have preached to you, he is to be a curse. This is anathema. That is devoted to destruction. And then he repeats it. As I said before, I say again. And to, to say something twice in the Judaistic culture was to put extra emphasis. This is of utmost importance. He said, I'm telling you again, if the fanciest, shiniest preacher you know with eight rows of white piano teeth and, and a custom-made Armani suit and those $1,500 Ric Flair alligators on his feet stands up and with slick words begins to tell you Jesus isn't enough, throw him out the door. If an angel comes in and starts telling us there's another way to be saved other than the gift of God through Jesus Christ, Mike will hold up the door and me and Morgan will throw him out by his hands. Let them be devoted to destruction, handed over to the world, get them out of your midst because there's only one good news message and that's the message of Jesus. Paul begins in chapters 1 and 2. He builds that argument. He said, first of all, let me tell you this. He said, Jesus called me and sent me to the Gentiles with the good news message that God saves them by faith alone in Christ alone. And he said, it was later on that I went up to Jerusalem where Peter, James, John, the other apostles who were ministering to the Jewish world. And I told them the gospel that I preached. And they said, hold my mule while I shout while some. We're preaching the same thing. There wasn't two messages. It wasn't law and legalism for one group and grace and freedom for the other. No, it's grace and freedom for everybody. That's the good news of the gospel. And the culmination of the gospel that John sees in the revelation of Christ, he said, I looked out and I saw people from every kindred, nation, and tongue forever with the Lord in the New Jerusalem. That's what the gospel's there for. It's for everybody. And, and yet, he, he then deals with another point. He says, you know, you guys remember when Peter came to visit you? And he said, Peter came preaching the same gospel. And he was hanging out with and having dinner with and doing things with Jews and Gentiles. 
But then these legalizers came in, and they came in like the Sopranos. They were strong-arming Peter. They started to pressure Peter. You better quit hanging out with them defiled Gentiles. They can't stand on holy ground with God's family and God's holy presence in a place where God is worshipped. Don't you eat with them. And Peter got a little nervous and he quit eating with them and then Paul showed up. And he rebuked Peter. And, and Peter graciously, apparently, has allowed this story to be retold by Paul because Peter was wrong and he knew it. And Paul needed to correct it. And God needed to correct him because, friends, and I want you to hear me, this is the message of the gospel that we must remember as a church. When somebody comes through the doors of this building, I don't care who they are. I don't care where they come from. I don't care what they've done in life. I don't care how entrenched in sin and evil and wickedness they are. We want to give them the good news of King Jesus, and we believe that he can change anybody's life. We believe that that which is unclean can be made clean by the Lamb and His blood. But they forgot that. These Judaizers had caused them to forget that. And then Paul ultimately, in chapters 1 and 2, he said, let me tell you about this powerful gospel message and how it works. He said it works by faith. He uses a, an Old Testament term of righteousness which speaks of God and, and it speaks of also being right with God. And, and he says... God justifies sinners. I mean, God declares us righteous. God makes us right with Him, forgives our sins, cleanses us of all impurity, sets us before Him as His children who have free access to commune with Him day and night, anytime, anywhere. He makes us a part of His family. He, he fills us with the Holy Spirit. He guarantees us eternal life. All this stuff, we receive all that free gift through Jesus Paul says, by faith. He quotes the Old Testament that the Judaizers loved. And he says, we are justified. We are made right. We are a part of God's family by faith alone in Jesus alone. It is not Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus kosher food laws. Jesus plus do's and don'ts. Jesus plus Sabbath days and holy. It's Jesus alone. He's enough. He is sufficient. You don't need anything else when you got the king. Because Jesus is the one to conquer sin, hell, death, the devil, the grave. He is the one who brought victory. He is the one who led the captives free. He is the one who arose triumphant. He is the one who is the lamb without spot and blemish. He is the one of whom the Father said, I am well pleased. All those who trust in Him. The Father now looks at Him and says, I have will, please. That's the good news. So being a part of God's covenant family is by faith in Jesus and what He did for us. The overall message of chapters 1 and 2 is this. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon who once said this. If I'm not mistaken, just forgive me, but I'm pretty sure it was Spurgeon who said, there's only two religions in the world. All religions in the world fall in one camp and it's called human achievement. Whether you're talking about Islam or you're talking about any of the other multitude of religions in the world, it's all about what you do for God to achieve your own salvation. But Christianity is built on divine accomplishment. It's what God accomplished for us on the cross and in His resurrection. Aren't you thankful for that? There's an old song that said, Jesus paid it all, and all to Him. That's what the gospel is all about. And then in, in chapters 3 and 4, he, he brings that to its concluding thought. And he says, this gospel that I'm preaching, that, that is the one only true real gospel, the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus, that's what creates Abraham's family. These Judaizers telling you they're the descendants of Abraham. They have the law. They know what the real truth is. He said they missed the whole point. In verses 13 and 14 of chapter 3, Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. How many of you know a curse came because of a tree? But he said he did it in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, the promise that God gave Abraham that all the nations of the world would be blessed, he said that has come to the Gentiles so that we can all receive the promise of the Holy Spirit 
new life, the life of God living in us. The new humanity, the family God wanted. It's for everybody who puts their faith and trust in the cross of King Jesus. And Paul points out in this little section, he said, Abraham was justified, declared righteous, sins forgiven, in the family of God. He was God's man hundreds of years before your laws were ever given. How did God justify? How was Abraham saved? By faith. Now that, of course, begs the question, well, why did God even give the law? Why did he give the Torah? Why did he give all those things? And, and Paul tells them, and for example, in chapter 3, verse 12, he says, really, there's a couple of reasons. He said, first of all, you need to understand, that's part of God's story of redemption that is slowly unfolding throughout human history that culminated with Jesus. He said, think about it, through Abraham and the patriarchs, uh, even throughout, there was promise that one would come who would be the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah, who would save his people from their sins. And also from that same lineage there come a King David, and it was promised that that one who would come would be the king who would reign triumphantly over all creation and that God's whole family would reign with him. And Paul explains that Jesus was that promise. Messiah, that promised anointed, that promised Christ, that promised Savior. Jesus was that promised King, and He has conquered the enemy that held captive the nations of the world. He has arose victorious over that last enemy, death, and He now reigns as Lord over all, and we can reign with Him in God's new creation, as God's new family, by faith in Him. But the purpose of the law, He said, in chapter 3, in God's story of redemption, he said the law came to expose like a magnifying glass that magnified and exposed the fact that we are sinners who need a sin. That sin has corrupted us, God's creation, all of humanity, all of the planet, everything. Sin is just horrible and it magnifies and exposes sin. Not only among the Gentile nations, but he says including Israel, you should see from the law you're sinners who can't keep it. We all break it. And second, he said the law had this positive role like a school teacher, like setting boundaries, but it was pointing to the day when the offspring of Abraham, the, the promised offspring of David, Israel's true king would come. And he said, now that the king has come, there's freedom from the law. And he says, when, so when you tell people to be a part of God's family, Jesus is not enough. But they got to go back and keep all the Torah and all the laws and all. He said, that's antithetical to the God. He, said, he says, basically, it does three things. He says, it, it, it acts like Jesus isn't enough. He actually says, the end of chapter, chapter 2, and I love this. He said, if you could be saved, right with God, declared righteous, uh, be a part of God's family. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Have eternal life. Be God's imagers in the world. If all that could happen by keeping the laws, Jesus Christ died for no reason. We didn't even need him to begin with. But the fact that he came and did what he did shows that we can't save ourselves. So when you're telling people to add things to the gospel, you're telling them Jesus isn't enough, and that's a denial of Jesus. And then he says, you're taking away the freedom Jesus gained for us. He died so we could be free to enjoy God without the constant guilt and shame and fear of the law and messing up all the time. Aren't you glad that when you want to pray, you don't have to live under a Levitical system that says you may have touched something, been around something, or something that represents death, and therefore you are corrupted, and if you come into holy space with God, He might kill you, so you better bring an offering to try and appease Him, or, or to, try and, to try and give something to Him, to try and do something that, that blood can purify the ground so that you don't mess it up with the stench of your wickedness. Do you understand why they were so scared to go into the tabernacle, why they had to bring offerings and... They were petrified. And here is God saying, come freely. You're clean. You're purified. You can come boldly to my throne of grace at any time, day or night, and enjoy communion. I love my kids. Come home. Come. 
And he who is thirsty, come. But the one who's hungry, come. If you got a burden, come. Bring it, come. Just come. And then people come along and say, God, you can't do that. Uh, that Jesus, Jesus is not enough. I tell you what, if you ain't living it, you ain't going to make it. You better be straightening your life up. You better be doing all these things. And we're, we're pushing people away from the king who's saying, I'm enough. Come. Paul says we can't do that. And he said, further the one. When we act like Jesus isn't enough, what we end up doing is what the Judaizers did. They were trying to limit God's family to one tiny ethnic group in the Middle East. I don't have time to get into what dispensationalism has done with the gospel, but I'll tell you this. There is one gospel message. There is one family of God. And the gospel message is Jesus saves and the family of God is everybody, regardless of race, creed, color, social standing, how much money you've got in the bank, what you've done, where you've been, what's your last. None of that matters. It's everybody who believes in Jesus. One multi-ethnic. You've got to remember that. I love in chapter 3, he says this in 28 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ... You are Abraham's descendants. In other words, you are the family of God. You are heirs according to the promise that you're going to be blessed by God and you're his children. Thank God for Jesus. <laughs> and then the final thing in chapters 5 and 6, and I'll go quickly. Paul knows that there are going to be some people standing there that says, now hold on a minute. We've had Torah, we've had this law, we've had Torah for hundreds of years. And it tells us what God's will is. It shows us how to live for God. How are all these heathen Gentiles, you and me, not ready for this stuff, how are they ever going to know how to live for God and obey God? How are they ever going to know how to live right if we don't impose the law on them? Paul says, listen, the law of God was good and it was wise. And it was written and made applicable for that people in that period of time. And, and there's a lot of wisdom in it. It tells us a lot about God and worshiping God and, and knowing God. But, but he says, I want to remind you, Jesus gave us a royal law. The king gave us a summary of the law and the wisdom behind it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. You can sum it all up. You take the Ten Commandments. The first half deal with loving God. Second half deal with loving your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal his wife. You're not going to steal his donkey. You're not going to steal his dog. You're not going to. You're not going to harm him. You're not going to maliciously murder him. You're not going to steal what he has. And if you love God, you're going to serve him. You're going to put him first in your life. And and so he he says that's the royal law. And he says, Jesus fulfilled that royal law. And he did that on our behalf. Listen, let me, let me explain this to you. He teaches them that law code, that love God and love neighbor and all that that includes, even as the wisdom of it is seen through the Torah. He said, Jesus is the only man who ever did that perfectly, and he did that perfectly for you. You know what that means? I believe in Jesus. The Bible says I'm in Jesus, hidden in Jesus, united to Jesus. So in Jesus, I'm righteous, just like Him. Again, it's what it's His perfect obedience. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that awesome? But 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 listen, how many of you know God wants us as His children now? When we have believed in Jesus, He does want us. To love God and love neighbor. To be his imagers. To be returned to who we were originally created to be. To be his imagers advancing his kingdom in the world. How do we do that? They were saying, well, you've got to have the law to do that. Paul said, no. we got something even better. Because under the law, he makes the argument, nobody can ever keep the law. He said, you all have had the law for hundreds of years and all you've ever done is break it. 
get sent into exile, sent into Egypt. You're sent into Babylon. You're taken captive by the Greeks. Now the Romans got you captive. You just continue being sent into exile because the holy ground where God dwells continues to be corrupted by your sin and law breaking. The law is like a teacher saying, you need another way. He said it never could keep you from sin. To the Colossians, Paul said this, you got people coming in there telling you that you've got to, you know, you've got to don't drink, don't taste, don't touch, don't wear, don't, 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 don't. And he said, none of those things have ever been able to keep people from sin. None of them have ever been able to keep people from sin. He said, so God's got something better. You see, when you come to the gospel, the new come, the good news through Jesus, when you believe in him, here it is. This is the culmination of the whole thing. And he contrasts. There, he says there's the old humanity, the old man, who you were under the law. And listen, everybody, whether they believe in God or not, if they don't know Jesus, they are imprisoned under the law and guilty and condemned under the law. And he said under that old humanity, you can have all the laws in the world. And he said, here's what happens. You still commit sexual immorality. You still give in to idolatry. You're given to division. You're murder. You're selfish. You gossip. You hate one another. You hurt one another. You're, you live for yourself and not others. He said you never love God and others when you, all you got is the law. That's the old humanity. But Jesus come that you could be a new creation. That means born again. A part of God's new family. God's real family. The family with Jesus as the king. And he says the new family has something that no law can stand against. He said Jesus' new family now lives not by Torah code, but by a new law of the Spirit. Walking in step with the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit against such there is no law. Things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, gentleness, temperance, self control a life that looks like Jesus. You said, now hold on a minute. Preacher, you said two minutes ago that none of us can ever live like Jesus. So Paul says, when you believe the gospel, God's got something better than Torah. The three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, help me somebody, God who? The Holy Spirit. Old folks call him the Holy Ghost to scare past. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. And he said, when you believe in Jesus, God the Holy Spirit brings that perfect life of Jesus who loved God and pleased Him, loved others and pleased God in doing so. That life of Jesus comes to live in you by the Holy Spirit and He makes you into the person God wants you to be. Your flesh can't conquer sin. Laws, rules, and regulations can't conquer sin. But Jesus did on the cross. Jesus did by being raised from the dead. He conquered sin, hell, death, the devil, and the grave. And now his life is in us by the Holy Spirit who begins to, Paul says, it's not automatic. You don't just get saved one day and you're living out the fruits of the Spirit the day. He said it's, he likens it unto fruit because it's like an orchard. If you don't take care of it, it doesn't bear fruit. He said we as, as believers, we have the Holy Spirit, but here's how he works. As we walk in the Spirit, it means in lockstep with the Spirit. That means that old humanity, all that old junk that's still in your life that brought contamination and evil and sin. He said, we run from it. And we run toward those things that look like Jesus. Love, joy, and peace. And he said, as you do that, God the Holy Spirit will empower your walk so that you can love God and love others like God calls you to. He said, the law can't do that. But the Holy Spirit of God in you can. And you get that spirit, regardless if you're male or female, bond or free, red, yellow, black and white. And if a little green Martian lands today, he can be saved by the grace of God and filled with the Spirit of God if he believes in King Jesus. Isn't that good news? Amen. I don't know about y'all, but for a heathen like me, that's what one man is. Not the idea of getting some laws, getting religion and changing my life, but the idea that he loved me and gave himself for me while I was a sinner. Unworthy, undeserving. And yet he bestowed his love and grace through his only begotten son. That's the good news. And we can't let anybody come up that good news. Let's stand together this morning. Morgan's going to come. He's going to minister.
our closing hymn for us. And as he comes to lead us this morning, if you're here and you have never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I implore you that today would be the day of your salvation, that you would turn to him and believe in him, that he died for your sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, raised again the third day, has ascended to the right hand of God, where he now reigns as the king. And all who call upon his name, Romans 10 promises, will be saved, will receive the forgiveness of sins, brand new life, adopted a part of God's new family, and the Spirit of God will live in you, and he'll begin to, you don't clean yourself up first, you catch the fish, and then God will it. The Spirit of God will live in you and make all things new. If you've never made that decision for Christ, I urge you, I plead with you, do that today. If you'd like to have somebody pray with you, I'd love to pray with you. If you're here and you've never been back, as we sing this morning, if the Spirit of God is moving on your heart, you feel the need to respond, we invite you to do so.